Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40 will be there in just a few seconds. I thought, I'll be honest with you, as, as I looked around these past few weeks and I saw all, all the suffering and everything going on, I just sought God. I said, God, speak to us about this, and, and, and he did. And this morning as I was standing there listening back there with Miss Joyce, I was looking around, and as a pastor, this can be one of the most disappointing Sundays there is in the year. And you say, why is that? And I said, well, we didn't even, we had a whole house full last week, and this week we didn't even make it to half that. Uh, you know, and you were like, you hope when they come, they feel the love or they hear something that would draw them back. And you, it's just disappointing that you see none of them come back, uh, you know, and and you think, well, what does it take to draw people in? Is it food or is it eggs? You know, <laughs> what does it take? And then, you know, he began to show me. And there's a lot of people that I'll invite to church, <laughs> and they ask, the, they ask this question, well, what's there for my kids? God. God is there. We're not a – church is not an entertainment, you know. And I see too many churches uh, – provide babysitting folks that's not what a church is for a church is to worship god and, and you know and and I, this one individual that i talked to said you know they they wanted their children to go somewhere else and i'm like so basically what you're looking for is for an hour uh that you don't have to watch your child you know that's what you're coming for well, how about watching your child and teaching them how to worship God? And I get fired up because, you know, I, I'm tired of seeing people uh, not giving God the due, the, the worship and the praise and the honor that he's, you know, he's due. And, and I talked to another pastor a couple weeks ago, and he said, oh, yeah, we had a great crowd this Sunday. We fed. <laughs> I'm like, folks. Don't you wish that they could see what we see? Don't you wish they could have what we have? It's not the food that's served in that kitchen. It's the food that he sends to us. Because how, I mean, folks, you can get food anywhere. Me and my wife went to West Memphis. They even have food. And I was teasing them. I said, you know, in each hotel you open up and it tells you everything to do in the town. You open it up in West Memphis and it says, get out. That's the thing to do. But, folks, you can look around and tell we can find physical food. It's not a problem. That, this world doesn't need physical food. They need Jesus. And it breaks my heart to see them, you know, all those little ones we had running through here. Folks, think about the world they're going to grow up in. And right now, they're on the track to live in this world without God. And, folks, that is nothing but failure. Oh, how the enemy will make them think they're winning. The enemy may even let them have a good job and make a lot of money, but their homes will be destroyed. Their marriages will be destroyed because they don't have that glue of Jesus Christ. But this message today, I've got good news for you because I, I told you when I looked around and saw all the suffering lately, I said, God, speak to us. And I believe with everything in my heart that he did. And I'm going to tell you a, 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 just a little story, and I know you've all heard it, but I want you to stick with me this morning because it's so true. But there's a story, and it's a true story about a 15-year-old boy. He didn't have the greatest home life in the world. But he, he decided when he was 15, he wanted to start playing basketball. He'd never played, like, organized ball. And so he went out for the high school team, and, and the coach pulled him aside and said, you know, you're just not good enough. You know, you need to go back and work on some things. Now, how many of us, when we're told by somebody we're not good enough, we just fold up our tent? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. The only person who matters is Jesus Christ, and he'll never tell us we're not good enough. But this coach told him he wasn't good enough. So this young man, he didn't quit. He went back and he worked and he worked. And you may have heard of him. His name's Michael Jordan. Uh, if he didn't make the basketball team in the 10th grade, I, I, think, I think we're all right. 
But, you know, they told just somebody local that you know, they told Dennis Huffman that the cancer was all over his body and that he just needed to go home and enjoy what time he had left. Folks, he didn't give up. And then he told me a few months back that when he went back, he was cancer-free. Folks, it's up to Jesus Christ. It's not up to the doctors. And when he's ready for us, that's when we'll go home. Amen? And when he's ready for us, we want to go home. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, what about somebody who received 199 stripes or beatings? Three times he was beaten with a rod. He was stoned. He was involved in three shipwrecks. And over the period of time, he was in the ocean over 24 hours. He's been hungry. He's been naked. He was cold. But he didn't give up. His name is the Apostle Paul. And I thought my worst fear would be in the water for 24 hours. I can tell you that right now. And I couldn't touch bottom. I'm going to tell you, I would have to have God. But you know what I thought? I know it doesn't say in Scripture, but I guarantee you while Paul was out there, he wasn't worried about the sharks. He wasn't even worried that his legs was getting tired, pumping, trying to keep himself up. He was praising God. That is something, church, we need to learn today. While he was being stoned, while he was being beaten, he was praising God. Paul didn't give up. Now, how many of us would have give up during some of that? Amen? But Paul didn't give up. So let me tell you something. Any of you been to where you thought you couldn't go one step farther? You thought you had reached it all. You had spent everything you had in you, and you just thought, I can't go on anymore. Well, I got good news for you. That is when you're the strongest, and I'm going to tell you why. If you would, turn with me to Isaiah 40. When you find that, if you would today, stand to honor for the reading of God's Word today. Isaiah 40. I'm going to read you one verse. Verse 29. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for answering our prayers. God, we thank you for speaking to us. God, we thank you for everything you've done for us. We thank you for this beautiful church that you've given us that we can meet here, God, and worship you. And God, I thank you for these faithful that show up, Lord, Sunday after Sunday, Lord. And Lord, I know some of them are hurting and I know some of them are in pain. And God, I know that this is going to happen while we live down here. But today, God, I just pray that you would speak to us courage and strength through your word. And Lord, just just embolden us to live our lives for you. And God, I pray now that it comes to preaching of your word. I pray that you'd forgive me of my sins, God. Wash me with your blood and prepare this vessel to speak your holy word. And God, I pray that you forgive each vessel in this house and wash us, Lord, and prepare us to hear your holy word. And Lord, so that we can apply it to our lives and be what you've called us to be. And in Jesus' precious holy name, as children all prayed. I want you to think back, church, to a time... When you were at your weakest, you were at your lowest. And you just didn't feel like you couldn't go on. You felt like you had went just as far as you could go. And when I got to thinking about it, I remembered a time. It was probably the, one of my least favorite times in my life was the first three weeks of troop school. I'm just going to be flat out honest with you. It stunk. You couldn't move to where you wasn't doing push-ups or you wasn't running or you wasn't doing something. And, and, you know, they tell you to get prepared. Well, I wasn't prepared. I thought I was prepared, but I wasn't prepared. And then if you stepped on the wrong square as you was going in to eat chow, you'd be sitting there doing push-ups while everybody else was eating. It, it was a fixed system. <laughs> they had it rigged. But for three weeks... There's no other way to put it, folks. It was like living in hell. Everybody yelling at you, everybody screaming, and you're doing push-ups and sit-ups, and you're, you know, and if they served you chili dogs, it was a setup. Don't eat the chili dogs because something bad going to happen that evening. I learned that real quick. Stay away from the chili dogs. But I want to tell you something, and this is how I kind of feel like we are with God. And many of us are still in our first three weeks 
And, and we're still, we're getting battered, we're getting bruised. I'll never forget going in on one Sunday night, there was nobody out in the hall. And I thought, hey, this is going to be a nice week. It's going to be quiet. And, and we're all tiptoeing with our suitcases up the stairs, hoping, you know, the DIs don't hear us in there. Guess what? They were tricking us. And as soon as we get in our rooms, we hear them down there, put your boots on and fall out. And I'm like, okay, so we're going to learn to march tonight because we're wearing our boots. Because if we're PTing, they'll, you have your uh, warm-ups and your tennis shoes on. So they fall us out. One man, one voice, calls and tells us to fall out. And we're out in our BDUs and our boots. So we're thinking, well, we're going to practice some marching. Nope. We ran five miles to Camden and back in our boots. And my feet and my toes were screaming. I, was, I thought I was prepared, but I wasn't prepared. You see, they changed the rules on us. Do you realize today, church, we live in a world that's not fair? Any of you ever been cheated? Ever, any been wronged? And Lord of mercy, how many of you voice it when you're wrong on the Facebook? <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I'm going to stay away. Do you know nobody cares if we get wronged? Have you noticed that? Who cares the most? We do. If our fries isn't ready when we pull up to the window and they ask us to park... Heaven help them people. I've got to pull up there and wait an extra two minutes. But I want you to see this spiritually. Because you see, after three weeks of troop school, after hundreds and hundreds, not thousands, of push-ups and sit-ups and running five miles in your boots, you reach a point where they can no longer hurt you. See, you reach a point where you're in such good physical condition, no matter what they want to do to you. See, after three weeks... Anybody they brought in, we were, as in, we were as in good a shape as they were. So no matter what they wanted to do, we could do it with them. Except one man. His name was Al Vernon Rogers. And he would he'd do what you call a V crunch. And he would tell us if we could do one as long as he could, we'd have the rest of the week off. Now granted, most of us were 25 to 30 year old. He was a lot older than that. So we thought, we'll smoke this old man and we'll take the week off. He put us to shame, folks. And that's sitting on the ground with your hands underneath your rear, your back slightly raised up and your feet off the ground. He sat there for an hour and a half. And he, we just fall and fall and fall. And finally, we're all done. We're hurting. And he's still sitting there. And he said, are y'all good? Y'all want me to get up now? I got another hour in me. We was like, no, let's just start running. I mean, <laughs> things are going to happen to you, and I wish they wasn't. I love, every, I, love, I love every one of you, and I wish nothing but great things would happen, but is that, is that true? We're going to have good days, aren't we, and we're going to have bad days. What we decide to do with those bad days is what, is what God's trying to tell us. I mean, Michael Jordan didn't quit. Dennis Huffman didn't quit. Paul didn't quit. Why should we? But how easy is it, church, to get mad and say, I'm just going to quit? It's easy, isn't it? I've done it. We've all done it. But you see, when we're at that point, when we're at our weakest, why do you think that's our strongest time? We have no strength left, right? Right? Any of you ever just worked yourself into the ground where your arms were shaking and you couldn't just you, I mean, you couldn't even lift anything anymore? I want you to know today that's when you're the strongest. Why is that? Because you quit relying on your strength and you look to heaven for his strength. How many of you, and I've used this example before, maybe it was your grandpa, maybe it was your dad, uh, when you were growing up, your dad was just hard, uh, disciplinarian, strict. You didn't see any soft side to him. And then all of a sudden, the grandkids come along. And you're like, where was that man while I was being raised? Who is that? He's changed, hadn't he? Why do you think a man gets more easygoing or loving as he gets older? 
because he's not depending on himself like he used to. How many of you can still do what you could do 30 years ago? No. There's a couple of you. Okay, I see you. Yeah. Y'all sure can't do what you could 30 years ago because you wasn't here. <laughs> but you will learn. When we're all gone and y'all are still here, y'all can tell the new preacher, hey, I can't do what I could do 30 years ago. But then, what do you do? Do you quit? Or do you start relying on God? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we relied on God when we had our full strength when we were younger? That would have been really good. But, you know, we have a patient God today. But, you know... One of the hardest things I think we deal with, and I know some of you, well, I know all of you, are praying for things that you're just not seeing results in right now. Amen? I think we're all doing that. So sometimes, and I, I want you to know, it's perfectly natural sometimes to doubt God. Say, God, are you not listening? Why am I not seeing anything? There's a lot of reasons that could be. And I'm going to be honest with you. Number one, if you're praying for something and you're not seeing it, check your heart. Make sure you have no sin in your life. How many still sin today besides me? Do you realize those sins have to be forgiven? Amen. You have to get those under the blood because, as Dr. Charles says, it affects your communication with God. God can't hear you if you have sin in your heart. The only prayer he'll hear from you if you have sin in your heart, is Father, please forgive me. And now how many of you have a prayer that you want answered really bad that you're not seeing an answer to? Well, this is a step process. Okay, number one, you may say, well, Pastor, I've asked for forgiveness. I'm good, and I'm still not seeing nothing. Okay, all right, stay with me. Is our timing God's timing? If we learn nothing else today, let's learn that. Our Father holds us in his hands. Our Father knows what tomorrow holds. We don't. And you know how I know that? Because every one of you would hit the lottery if you knew what tomorrow held. I'm just kidding, but I will share this with you. Me and my wife, we, we were in a hotel directly across the street from the casino. Fortunes to be made just a few feet away. All we had to do was cross the street. And, I mean, I know we'd have been rich. I said, let's go in there, charge up everything we can on that credit card, lay it down on black, and spin that wheel. I said, we'll either leave there rich, or we'll be calling a cab, saying, Ken, can you come get me? <laughs> now, we didn't go, but I said, wouldn't it be, I said, this is what would happen, one of two things. We'd either go in there, and they's giving away a Jeep, and I said, and you'd know it, we'd win the Jeep. And there'd be our picture. Pastor and pastor's wife win Jeep at local casino. I said, we'd make Cagelsville proud. I said, or I'd put that money in that slot machine and I'd win. And then Jesus would split the eastern sky. And there I'd be sitting in the casino. I was like, we'll just sit over here at the hotel. <laughs> but... <laughs> I don't, want, I don't want you to think this morning that things are going to get easier next week or next week. I, I do want you to know we live in a fallen world. We live in a world full of sin. But we are not of this world. We are born again this morning. And this only applies to you if you've given your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. If you have not, friend... Please hear me. This, this promise does not apply to you. Nothing applies to you until you give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. But you see, Paul, would you say Paul could pray? <laughs> Amen. Would you, would, would you say Paul had a direct line to God? Which we do too. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying, would you say Paul was probably... a uh, definitely a holy man. Did you know he prayed three times to God for God to remove the thorn from his flesh? 
and God didn't do it. <laughs> Please stay with me. I know this is not popular, but what if, whatever you're praying for, what if you're praying amiss? Paul was praying for his ailment to be healed. Now, I believe with everything in me, it was Paul's eyesight. I believe if you read and study, I believe Paul was going blind. I believe in the later years, that's why Luke wrote an epistle for him. I believe uh, a letter for him. I believe that's why Titus wrote a letter for him. I believe because Paul lost his eyesight. And I believe Paul was asking God three times. But now listen, this is Paul. I told you earlier, he'd been shipwrecked, stoned, beaten. This is the apostle Paul, probably outside of Jesus Christ, the greatest apostle to ever walk this earth. Paul prayed, God, answer me. God, take away this. But God chose not to. Listen to the conversation. In 2 Corinthians 12 and 9, it is very important here that you differentiate between Paul and Jesus. And I'm going to do that for you. 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. This is Paul. And he said unto me, he's talking about Jesus. Now this is Jesus. My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Stop. Now this is Paul. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Lord have mercy, folks. If we could, if we could take that and get it into ourselves, it would change everything about our lives. Paul started out like us. God fix it. It's hurting me. I can't help it. And maybe it's a loved one. Maybe it's a child. Maybe I don't care what it is this morning. God fix it. It hurts. Maybe it's physical pain. God fix it. It hurts. And what does God say? My grace is sufficient for thee. Why? Because my strength is made perfect in weakness. Folks, the weaker we get physically, the more likely it is that we turn to our strength spiritually. Exactly the same reason. I know you women in here with an amen. You've either married to or you were raised by a stubborn man. Y'all enjoyed that a little too much. Because when you amen and then you giggle, that tells me, did you see, whether it be your father or whether it be your husband or whether it be your grandfather, did you see a change in them the older they got? Other than they couldn't hear as well. Yes, children, you can amen that. I can't hear well. Huh? Uh. But something happened. What happened to them physically, I want to happen to us spiritually. Quit depending on yourself. Folks, on our own, we can't make it. On our own, we find ourselves... Addicted to alcohol, addicted to drugs, addicted to power, addicted to sex, addicted to all these things. On our own, you got to remember, how are we born? <coughs> We're born in the flesh. Remember what I told you about the apple? What's worse than uh, uh, an apple with a worm in it? Half an apple with a worm in it. Because you just ate the worm. But... Many people think the worm comes from the outside and burrows in the apple. No. The egg is laid in the blossom. The worm comes out of the apple. You see, the worm is born in the apple. And as it grows, it will come out of the apple. Guess what's born in us? Sin. I don't care how good an old boy or a girl you are. You were born a sinner. And you have to be born again. But you see, so many people live by, well, we're, we're warned about it in James. He tells us to be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving our own selves. We need a Savior. 
We need God. How many today realize that you can't live your life without Jesus Christ? Amen. And look at all the people that are trying. Look at how full this church was last Sunday. And they heard about Jesus. They saw a play about Jesus. They heard the word. They heard the songs. But as of today, what decision have they made? And I don't know about you, but it breaks my heart to see all those little ones that have been taught that all God is is an egg hunt one Sunday a year. All God wants is to be a part of every part of your life. There's nothing going on in your life right now that God don't want to be a part of. And please hear me, because there's, this is going away. This kind of preaching and this kind of talking, uh, and I'll tell you something in a minute to back this up. God will not reward disobedience, period. I know there's a lot of churches disagree with that, and they'll preach it, but folks, they're lying. God does not award, reward disobedience. So if you're praying for something and you're living some way you wasn't supposed to live, let me tell you something. You're not going to see it. God's not going to hear your prayer if you're living outside his will. Except for what prayer? Forgive me. Thank God he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. I pray, but just this week I heard it, and I'm going to guarantee this will fit every one of you. Matter of fact, I'm just going to... I'm going to trick you. Can I tell you up front I'm going to trick you? I'm going to trick you. How many with an amen believe that it's none of the school's business to be teaching our children K through any grade about uh, choosing a sex they want to be? Amen. amen. Well, guess what? You are all now considered a hate group. I, was, I heard this week on the radio, and this is a senator. Somebody that we, well, we didn't vote for him, thank God. But somebody elected this man, and he stood up and said that it's none of the parents' business, and somebody needs to teach them, and if you disagree with that, you're full of hate. What did Jesus tell us would happen in, in, in the last times? He said they would hate us, did he not? But he said because they hated him first. Folks, buckle up. It's coming. But you see, if we will glorify God, as Paul said, let his power rest on us. How many of you today want God's power resting on you? Amen? You see... So let me ask you, when we're facing an attack, and I know, I look around this room, I know a lot of you are facing an attack. What do we do? Well, it is written. Let's read it. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Keep seeking, keep praying, keep working, keep pushing. It's not in vain. Folks, if you have something going on in your life right now and, and the devil's attacking you and he's knocking you down, let me tell you how you get out of that. Number one, you pray. But number two, if he knocks you down and you can't stand up, you crawl to help somebody else. If your focus, if we can take our focus off of ourselves and put it on somebody else, folks, I'm telling you, that moves mountains. That moves the hand of God because pretty soon, if the devil knocks you down, he takes your feet out from under you and you're crawling and you're crawling to help somebody else, pretty soon you won't even realize that you're up again and you're moving. That's how God works. Does God want us to be selfish? You know, and I've been thinking about this, and, and, and we're going to do it here really soon. And I said this once before, but it slipped my mind. But we need to do it just for a simple fact, and that's have a foot washing. I can think of nothing else more humbling than a foot washing. And I don't think we should do it because, you know, I, I don't necessarily think 
when Jesus said, you know, I do this for you, I, I believe he is speaking in a, in a greater, greater sense. What he was saying is be a servant. Put, put others in front of you. But you see, well, so many things happen this week. Just to remind me how selfish the world is we live in. People only care about themselves. And so when a Christian comes along, when I say Christian, I mean a true Christian, do they stick out like a sore thumb? Amen. Because why? Because they care about other people. They're not so selfish, you know. And <laughs> I've got to be good. But we self-promote more than anybody I've known in history. And me and my wife was talking about it earlier. K-Love. I don't know how many of y'all listen to K-Love. But they have, what's it called on Mondays? Make a Difference Monday. So what do you do on Make a Difference Monday? You call in and tell them how you've blessed somebody. Folks, that's as anti-scriptural as you can get. Call in and tell them how good a Christian you are. Well, I found out Sister Frankie didn't have no eggs. So I went and worked 36 extra hours overtime so I could buy Sister Frankie three cartons of eggs, and I delivered them and said, God bless you, sis. What does the Bible tell us about our deeds? Shut your mouth. Don't be advertising. And I, like, we've talked many times about this. I see churches put it out there. We gave this many shoes. We Read the Bible. God does the advertising. You know, that's why y'all, and I'm not saying it because you're my congregation, y'all bless me beyond measure because I'll have people come up and tell me something y'all have done for them. I had no idea. Nobody said a word. And I said, thank you, God. I said, that's how you get blessings. That's why we're blessed because you all love people and you are all got given hearts, but you don't broadcast it. You're not on Facebook saying, well, I just gave... 62 orphans, 62 pairs of shoes, because I'm a really good person. Who are you, when you do that, who are you shining the light on? You. Where are we supposed to shine our light? Jesus Christ. But you see, just keep seeking, keep praying. Uh, you know, we've used the word push before. Pray until something happens. And that's not, how many times does it happen in our time frame? <laughs> not very often. I think there's a reason for that. But you see, here's, here's something else we have to acknowledge. Anybody out there got some people you really don't like? Mm, let's not talk about lying. Anybody out there got somebody that you really don't like? Amen. Amen. But did you know you could love them? And did you know the closer we grow to God, He will, if we allow the Holy Spirit to do His work in us, did you know the Holy Spirit can love them through us? They can change us. This is what you must know this morning as we start to wrap this up. God's power is for anyone, anyone, that will receive it. It does not require a college education. It does not require lots of money. It does not require popularity. If I went around this room right now, and yes, this is a setup, and I ask you, I said, we need to start, let's just say, a Bible study on Thursday evenings. And I come to you right, and I call, just right now, if I called your name out, and I said, I want you to lead Bible studies on Thursday, teach us the Bible. Don't answer me. Just keep it to yourself. But how many of you would be comfortable with that? Or how many would give me some kind of lame excuse? I just, I don't feel comfortable talking in front of people. I, I don't know, you know. Let's be honest. Most of us would do that. I did it for a long time. And then I finally gave in and said, I'll teach Sunday school. But that's it. I'm not doing, you You know, and then I got comfortable teaching Sunday school. I said, God, that's it, no more. 
And then I'll never forget the day. I said, Jim, I think God's calling me to preach. And she just started laughing. Because she said, I know he is. And he has been. It's not us, church. It's not me. It's not you. It's us allowing him to do something through us. And now I want to prove it in Scripture. Acts 4.13. Now, now let me ask you before I read the Scripture. How many of you would consider yourself as able to spread the gospel as Peter and John? Hmm. That's kind of stunning, isn't it? How many of you feel as qualified right now to spread the gospel as Peter and John? Oh, this is a trick, and you're going to love this one. All right, so none of you feel like you're as qualified as Peter and John. All right, listen to Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. I'm not going to stand up here and say you just called yourself ignorant. I'm not going to do that. Peter and John were unlearned. They had no college diploma. They had no high school graduation certificate. They were not smart men. They were unlearned. Hmm. They were ignorant. What does ignorant mean? It means you don't know something. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It means you're just ignorant of the fact. So here's two men, Peter and John. Doesn't get much better than that, does it? The Bible clearly tells us they weren't smart men. <clears throat> they might walk out and grab the electric fence every now and then just for grins and giggles. Peter and John. But listen to that last line. What made them different? They had been with Jesus. Folks, that's what makes the difference. It's not a diploma you hang on the wall. It's not the amount of your paycheck. It's not how popular you are. It's that you've been with Jesus. Folks, how many today believe that you can make a difference in this world by allowing Jesus to live through you? Amen. Amen. Four of you. I promise you, you can. Folks, how do you think God speaks today? You, how do you think he touches? You, how do you think he blesses? You, do you believe <coughs> in coincidences? Nope, I don't either. How many of you has ever needed something or turned on the radio and heard a, heard a, heard a word or got a text from somebody at the right time or somebody stopped by to visit or somebody dropped something off? There are no accidents. But who's doing the dropping off? Who's doing? Folks, if we don't do it, who will do it? If God prompts you to do something, all I'm telling you is do it. And he will give you the words to say. I promise you. I think I've told you this before, but I was going to see a man one time that hated my guts. But God, I, we've got a cross, I think it's, it, we, it was in Molly's room for a while, but it's a very special cross to me. It looks just like this one hanging here. We bought it from Teen Challenge. But, folks, I'm going to tell you something. That cross is anointed. Whenever I, whenever I grab a hold of that thing, I feel the power of God, and, I, and I'll take it with me if I'm going somewhere where I know there's going to be a spiritual battle. And this, God had told me to go see this man, and I did not, and nothing inside me wanted to go see this man. Because in my other line of work, me and him are what you call enemies. We're on a different side. But I no longer serve that side. I've got to serve God. And God said, you know what? You need to go see him. And I, I'll just be honest with you. I wasn't real sure we wasn't going to end up fighting all across the, the property. Because here I am driving into his, his area. And so I, 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 take that, I take that cross and I say, God, you know how I feel about this person. I'm going to have to have you take control of me. And Holy Spirit, I am surrendering to you and you speak through me. And folks, by the time my foot hit that first step, he'd come out the door with tears coming down his cheeks. And he said, I was hoping to see you. Folks, do you think that's an accident? 
Do you think God had been working there before I got there? Amen. Do you think I would have failed had I not went? <clears throat> I, would have, I would have let God down. That would not have happened. Folks, when God puts it in your heart, and I know he prompts every one of you. Maybe it's call somebody, write a letter. You know, I don't care what it is. Do it. And if you say, you know, if you're like me and you're worried about what to say before you get there, just stop before you get there and say, Holy Spirit, I can't do this on my own. Please speak through me and you watch what happens. So no matter what, when you're with Jesus, you can be used to do anything. And I want to I close with this promise. And again, this promise is only for the child of God. But for, for those of you out there right now that are tired, for those of you out there right now are hurting, for those of you out there right now that, that just keep praying and you're not seeing results, for all these things and, and you're starting, you, you know, the devil tells you to give up. Just listen to what it says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Let me put it another way. You will overcome. You will be victorious. You will win if you don't give up. Keep seeking God. If you would, stand with me all over this building. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. This is a very, very personal and serious moment. I want to ask you this morning, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? If you don't, friend, please listen to me. I encourage you to step out from where you're at. Walk down this narrow path to this altar and give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. It is the greatest decision that you could ever make, and it is the only way that you can live through this world and, and have joy. You may not always be happy, but you will always have joy. Maybe you're praying for something and, and you're not seeing results. Well, friend, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're, there's no use in praying. The only prayer that He will hear from you is a prayer of forgiveness. If that's a relationship that you need today, what a day, friend. My Bible tells me today is the day of salvation. I know the enemy may be sitting on your shoulder and he may be trying to get you to be proud and, or say, well, you'll be embarrassed. No, there's no reason to be embarrassed. Everybody in this room is a sinner. We're either forgiven or we're not. The only thing to be ashamed of is living this life and not ever accepting Jesus Christ. If you're here this morning and you want to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, I invite you to this altar and we'll pray with you and my Bible tells me that your name will be written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. It's simple. All you got to do is believe, confess with your mouth, and believe with your heart. If you're here this morning and you're already a child of God, but you're in a storm, maybe you're tired, maybe you're beat down, maybe you just need some strength, maybe you're like the Apostle Paul and you've been begging God to to heal you of something or take something out of your life. Well, God's here today to tell you His grace is sufficient. Do you need a touch from Him today? Do you need some strength? Do you need some encouragement? If you do, our Father is always there to strengthen you. He's like the wind. You may not can see the wind blow, but you can certainly see the effects. Our God's the same way. You may not can see Him today, but you can feel Him. And if you know how to look, you can look with his, you can look with your eyes and you can see God. You can see God in the mountains. You can see God in the trees. You can see God in other believers. It all depends on how you look. Do you need anything today? God does not want you to be weak. God does not want you to be tired because there are battles ahead. Let him strengthen you today.